Thanks, Michelle. Well, this is the second in our series on the book of Esther, and I want to back up just a little bit and, and review a couple of things we talked about last week. Uh, some of your Bibles will talk about Ahasuerus the king, and some of them will talk about Xerxes the king. And just so there's no confusion, they're one and the same person. It's just one is the Hebrew uh, form of, the, of his name and the other is the Greek form. Now uh, Xerxes is a name that may be familiar to you from the movie The 300 Spartans and the battle at Thermopylae there. Well this is the Xerxes uh, that invaded uh, Greece. He's the Persian king that invaded and that's what you see in the movie. And so that kind of gives us a little bit of familiarity with what we're talking about. Now last week we went through chapter 1 and we met uh, two of the main players. We met uh, Ahasuerus and we met uh, Vashti, his queen. And uh, they had some problems, you remember the story, and Vashti is banished and now he's going to tr get a new queen. Now we're going to meet two more people this week. We'll meet Esther and Mordecai. You remember they never had, their name was nowhere in chapter 1. So Esther and Mordecai. And the other thing uh, that we talked about was uh, God is not mentioned in the entire book of Esther. But the thing we want to get from this book, if we get nothing else, is that even when we don't see him there, when we don't see him working, even when his name isn't mentioned, we, go, we are going to see that God is uh, working constantly to bring this story to the conclusion that he has in mind for it. So having said all that, uh, let's look at chapter 2 and uh, see what there is for us, see what God has for us to learn here. Now you've all heard uh, that uh, old saying, uh, you can't be in two places at once. You've heard that, right? But that's really what the, the place we're in as Christians. We are living in two places at once, just as Mordecai and Esther were. We're living on this earth. Uh, we are citizens of this earthly uh, kingdom, but we are also living in eternity. We have eternal life. We're living in God's kingdom. Our eternal life doesn't start when we die. It starts when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So we, as Mo Esther and Mordecai, have to live now in these two kingdoms. And the two kingdoms, uh, one of the things that makes it difficult is, the two kingdoms uh, are built on vastly different principles, aren't they? And they have vastly different rules. But well, we saw last week that every little thing about life, every little detail was regulated by the empire. The king regulated everything, every move you make. But then in God's kingdom, we're regulated by grace. And Paul tells us we are no longer under law, but under grace. We have tremendous freedom. We can live in any way we see fit, which is also a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because we have the Holy Spirit living in us and He constrains us and hopefully we will try to live lives that will reflect favorably on our King. So the kingdoms are different and the kings are vastly different. We talked about that last week. We talked about uh, the things that motivated Ahasuerus and versus the things that motivate our King Jesus. Everything Ahasuerus did, every move he made, were for his benefit. All of his realm existed for his benefit. Then we look at our King Jesus and we see that everything he did <clears throat> was for our benefit. Totally opposites. Kingdoms are different, the kings are different. When we met Ahasuerus and Vashti last week, we saw that they were very powerful people. Now, you remember uh, the Persian Empire was the biggest empire the world had ever seen at that time, and Ahasuerus ruled it all. The most powerful man in the world, and his queen, the most powerful woman in the world. The two people we will meet today, Esther and Mordecai, are the exact opposite. They have no real influence. 
They're second-class citizens. They're Jews living in, in Persia. Uh, they came there as, as captives, not them personally, but their ancestors did. And there they are, and nobody really cares about them one way or another. They have no input. They have no say in what goes on. They're just there. But it's going to be interesting as we see what happens. Again, last week we, we found out that the most powerful man in the world was powerless when he came to controlling his wife. There's a little nugget, guys, you want to kind of latch on to. Remember, his word was everything, and when he spoke, people listened, and the one word you never, ever uttered to the king was no. But what did Vashti do? He's, throw, he's got this big party going on. He's going to impress all of his friends. All the soldiers are there. He's going to impress them by having his wife come, and he's going to show her off a little bit, his trophy bride, you know. She said no. Now, <clears throat> that didn't set real well with the king. So, of course, he has her banished. But it shows you that we can have all this worldly power and there are still some of the simplest things we have no control over whatsoever. One of the most remarkable things about Esther and Mordecai is that they are absolutely unremarkable. They're just two people trying to live out their lives in a foreign land as best they can. They've been assimilated into the culture and they're just trying to get by. As I was studying for this, it, it, the words of uh, Henry David Thoreau came to me. He was, if you're not familiar with him, he was a 19th century uh, American author. And his most famous quote is that most men simply live out their lives in quiet, desperation yeah that's so true oftentimes you know we we're just we're just little people in a big world we don't have a lot of influence we don't have a lot of say maybe we don't have a job we like maybe we don't have a spouse we like maybe whatever so but we're we're grinders so we just we put one foot ahead of the other and try to do as best we can just living it out. And that's kind of where Mordecai is and where Esther is because they don't have any options. As we'll see, Mordecai had a job. He was making a living, uh, but nothing exciting. You remember now they've been there for 122 years, the Jews have, and with a 30-year life expectancy, that means we're on about the fourth generation now. And I can imagine Mordecai by the way, if you trace the lineage back, he was a descendant of David. And I can imagine him thinking, well, where is God? We're supposed to be God's people. We're supposed to be ruling and reigning with Christ. You've heard that, haven't you? And we are. Well, then how is it we're stuck here under this iron fist of the Persians. Where is God? A phrase probably all of you have uttered at some time in your life. When something was going on in your life that you couldn't control, it was causing you problems, it was causing you pain, maybe physical, mental, emotional, whatever, it go, and you can't, do, there's nothing you can do about it. And we, we say, where is God? If God loves me, where is he? Why does he let this stuff happen to me? Um, in 1776, a guy by the name of Adam Smith, he, he wrote a book, a book on economics, and it was called An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. And in that book, he put forward a theory he calls the invisible hand. And in that book, he explains how there is an invisible hand that works uh, constantly in the economy of nations uh, to bring various things about. And it's worth reading if you've never read it. 
Uh, our founding fathers were all very well acquainted with Adam Smith and his work. Well, I would suggest to you that the same is true in our lives. There is an invisible hand, namely the hand of God, that is constantly working, usually behind the scenes, well, unseen, unheard, but there it is, it's working, and it's directing our lives, it's, it's working for our good. Again, we don't always see that, but that's what we're going to see here in Esther, how the invisible hand of God is working in their lives to bring about a positive end. Well, here we have this thing all set up. Esther's going along, living her life. Mordecai is going along, living his life. And all of a sudden, everything changes. Mordecai and Esther had their lives pretty well lined out. Though they weren't exciting, they were okay. They managed to eat. They managed to clothe themselves. He had a job. And she was busy learning the things that a young woman would need to know to get along in this world. But all this was about to change. And we look at chapter 2, verse 8. And we see, So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther, who was taken into the king's palace and put in the custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. All of a sudden, she is summoned, along with all of these other women, to be set apart in the king's harem. Now, you might think, well, why didn't she pitch a fit? Well, when the king summoned you, you went. It was that simple. Because you'd lose your head otherwise, and you didn't want to do that. And it was not so unusual in those days for these things to happen. So, she goes. Now, for Esther, this could go a couple of ways. This could be the beginning of a truly exciting adventure. Bear in mind, she's a young girl. We don't know how old she was. Maybe 14, 15, 16, 17. Who knows? But at that age, things like this can be a great adventure. Or, it could go the other way for her, and it could be a terrifying ordeal. But either way, resistance was futile. Her fate was sealed. So Esther decides to make the best of her situation. And we read here in verses 9 and 10, And the young woman pleased him, that is Haggai, and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women from, whom, from the king's palace, and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. I said that our heroes today, Esther and Mordecai, are indeed heroes of the faith, but they're also flawed and fragile individuals, just as we are. Now, Esther hides the fact that she is one of God's people. She just decides not to say anything. And so, she's going to make the best of this thing. So Esther is also a very smart young girl. And she decides that she's going to not only play the game, but she's going to be the best at playing the game. And she is. And she impresses Haggai, and he gives her all her cosmetics, and gives her all this food, and she's on her way. Now, by the way, in, in that era, and for up until just probably the last couple hundred years, uh, beauty was not what we consider it. You know, we consider beauty to be thin. They considered beauty to be a little more rotund. And so uh, what, they were, what they might be doing is they're going to fatten up these commoner girls a little bit so they're more beautiful. So they feed them. And all you have to do is look at art from times past and you'll see what I'm talking about. So anyway, he's given her all this food. He's given her all these cosmetics. And she's working her way into his good graces. Now, some have been very critical of Esther over this behavior. 
And if you come at it from a judgmental point of view, I can see where you can be that way. And what they usually do is they compare Esther to Daniel. If you're familiar with the book of Daniel. Daniel got there the same way she got there, only a couple hundred years earlier, hundred years earlier, rather, excuse me. And he comes and they bring him the food. Remember the story? They bring this nice food for him. And what does he do? Well, let's just take a look here and we'll see what he does. Over here in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. So you see what we do is we set these two people in juxtaposition against one another and we say, well, Esther just caves in and dives into the food and drink and cosmetics and stuff and uh, joins right in. Well, Daniel, he stood up. Goes on. Therefore, he, Daniel, asked the chef of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. I want you to notice now, Daniel didn't refuse to eat the king's food. Here's a little, Daniel asked the eunuch, the person that brought the food, if it would be all right if he didn't eat the king's food. And the eunuch acquiesced and said, yeah, it's okay. So, a couple things there. Daniel, we admire him for standing up. Not taking anything away from him that. But notice he did it in a proper way. He asked permission. He didn't stand up there and say, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm not going to do this stuff. He asked permission and, and he was granted it. So let's see what happens to Esther now. We're going to be back and forth with Esther and Daniel as we go along. Verses 15 through 17. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her in as his daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. Now when Esther was taken to the king into the royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tiberth, in the seventh year of the is reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Well, now, our little undercover Jewish girl, her situation has changed, hasn't it? She's gone from a person with no power, with no influence, to the wife of the most powerful man in the world. That's quite a difference. Now we can argue back and forth how she got there. Uh, we, we can say she did it right, she did it wrong, but either way, she got there. Isn't it odd? that this story is in the Bible for us. If I were writing the Bible, I would not have put it in there. Because it almost looks like God is saying He will bless us sometimes even when we compromise. Even when we let our fears override the things we know we should be doing. How can that be? Well, if I didn't believe that we're saved by grace, kept by grace, governed by grace, that's the question I would ask. How can that be? But God is such a gracious God that even when we do things we shouldn't do or don't do things we should do, that invisible hand is still there. It's still watching over us. And things are still moving according to his purpose. Well, that's Esther. Let's talk a little bit about Mordecai. Chapter, verses 19 through 22. 
Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And they came to the knowledge, this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Now we learn a few things here. One, we see that Mordecai is sitting at the gate. Well, that's where official business transpired in those days. And so we can glean from this that Mordecai was some kind of a civil servant, probably some mid-level bureaucrat, uh, and it, because he's there at the gate, so he's privy to a lot of things that are going on. Now here's my question for you. Was it just coincidence that Mordecai is this mid-level official sitting at the gate? Or is it providence? Is it God's hand? Did God want Mordecai sitting at that gate at that point in time for a reason? Or was it coincidence? Now look at this next thing. He just happens to overhear these two guys plotting to kill the king. Coincidence? Or providence? And here's another thing to think about. How in the world, if you were plotting to kill the king, would you be so careless as to let some civil servant overhear your plan? Because we know what the penalty is going to be. Coincidence? Or providence? And why... When Esther goes in and tells Ahasuerus, why does not Ahasuerus reward Mordecai? Now we talk a lot about how these kings would put down any rebellion. You know, if they thought there was any chance you were going to cause trouble, you just lost your head. It was that simple. Well, they were just as quick, on the other hand, to reward feats of faithfulness. So if you were a guy like Mordecai and you told the king of a plot to kill him, man, you got, you got a party and you got things lavished on you because he wants other people to see what happens when you're loyal. Just like he wants other people to see what happens when you're disloyal. But somehow... He forgets. He remembers to kill the, the guy who's doing the plot, but he forgets all about Mordecai. Coincidence or providence? This will become very important later on. Well, what do we learn from all this? That's chapter 2 doesn't sound very theological. We didn't parse any Greek words. We, a lot of things we didn't do. But I think we can, we can learn some important lessons from this second chapter. And the first one is one we don't always particularly like, but sin slash disobedience always has its consequences. Even the sins of others can have a negative effect on us. You remember why were Esther and Mordecai in, in Susa in the first place? Because their ancestors were brought there, right? By the Persians. But why were they brought there? Disobedience. The kingdom of Judah had been disobedient to God, disobedient to God, disobedient to God. And finally he sends Nebuchadnezzar in there Three times, as a matter of fact, he, he came to Jerusalem. And you would think they would learn, but they didn't. And finally, the third time, he just wipes it out. 
and hauls them back with him. The sins of their forebearers is what got them into Persia. But then they had an opportunity to rectify the situation. In 538 BC, Cyrus becomes the new king. And what does Cyrus do? Well, he decides, he makes a decree, well, all the Jews that want to go back can go back. You remember, you read about it in Ezra and Nehemiah. And a lot of them went. But Esther and Mordecai's ancestors stayed. Well, why did they stay? Well, we don't know, but we can, we can conjecture a little bit. Uh, going back to Jerusalem at that, at that time was like going back into the wilderness. At least in Susa, they had food, they had clothing, they had the necessities of life. They, they may be a very dull existence, but it was safer. How many people, how many Christians, miss out on tremendous ministry opportunities because it's safer to stay where you're at. We're afraid sometimes to step out. God opens up opportunities for us. And we see there's an opportunity there and we say, oh, there's a ministry I could be involved in. Oh, there's a place I could contribute. But it's safer just to stay here where I am. And so they don't. Fear, the desire for comfortable living, kept the people in bondage. Second class citizens in a godless land. Esther's even married to a godless husband. But you know, this does help us to understand passages like uh, Exodus Chapter 34, verse 7. This is one of the perennial questions that Christians always ask, you know. God says he vishes the, the sins of the fathers onto the sons and even to the third generation. And we look at that and we say, well, how can that be? Because other places it says he does not hold the sins of the father against the son. Well, what he's talking about is this right here, these kinds of situations. Those that have gone before us commit sins and, and do things that affect us. See? You know, talk to, talk to somebody that's in the counseling business. You know, and they'll tell you about people they deal with that are struggling because of <clears throat> nothing they did, but sins that were committed by their parents or their grandparents or whatever. Those things affect us. But even here, we see God subtly working to turn evil for good. You know, it's like Romans 8, 28, the passage we always throw out, you know, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. And he does. We may not see it. We may not feel it. It may not work for our, what we perceive as our good right now, but it will ultimately, will it not? Of course it will. Second, we must do our best to submit to the authorities God has placed over us. We saw that in Daniel. We see that in Esther. Now they did it in very vastly different ways, but they both did it. In Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. And, and I, I admit, this is, a, this is a tough one. But now, Romans was written by Paul. When? Who's king? We've changed empires now. We're in the Roman Empire. But who's king? Nero. And if anybody could make the Hasserus look good, it'd be Nero. And so the... Paul is under great persecution. He's going to eventually get his, lose his head to this guy. So that's the context this is written in. And here's what he says. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. Now that's a tough verse. That's a really tough verse because we don't always like the authorities 
God has put in place over us. But he says obey them anyway. Now think about that if you are a first century Christian and he's telling you to obey a guy like Nero. It's unthinkable. But that's what he says. Now sometimes this obedience will look differently. But it is never presumptuous. Even uh, Daniel, you know, has, as I say, he asked permission not to eat the food. And a very good little piece of scripture is uh, Daniel 3, verse 17. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, I hope you become familiar with it, because it, it really tells us a lot about how things should be done. Now we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Nebuchadnezzar is about to throw them into this fiery furnace. You remember the story? Okay, and Daniel speaks up and he says, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. But what I want you to notice there is, Daniel did not say, our God will deliver us from this fiery furnace. He did not say that. He said our God is what? Able to deliver us from this fiery furnace. You see it would be presumptuous for him to say God will deliver us because he didn't know that. I'm sure he was hoping that. Yeah. But I've, I was raised in churches where we were, you demanded things from God and you really claim this and claim that and all that craziness. But these guys, Daniel and his friends, have their theology right. Our God is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Now look what he says. And he will deliver us from your hand. Now, is he being presumptuous? No, because he knows one way or another he's going to end up with Jesus Christ. If he burns to death in that fiery furnace, he goes to heaven. Boom. If he doesn't burn to death, God has delivered him. Either way, God delivers him out of that hand. But then one more thing I want you to notice in this verse. Then he says, But if not, be it known to you that we will not serve your God. So even if God doesn't deliver me, and I can just imagine, as I'm sure you can, those dear brothers and sisters in the Middle East right now, and don't you just imagine that they're praying with all the fervency they can muster that God will deliver them from this ISIS scourge? But God doesn't always, in, as we see it. He delivers them in the sense that he takes them to heaven to be with him as soon as they're killed. But we wonder, why? I don't know why. But we know this. God is working. His hand is working. And that's the last thing I want to talk about for just a minute is that invisible hand. If you would have been there to ask Esther and Mordecai if they thought they were being mightily used by God to accomplish his purpose, their response would have probably been one of incredulity. In other words, they would have laughed in your face, probably. Hey, what do you mean God's using us? Mordecai says, I'm in a dead-end job going nowhere. Uh, my niece is married to one of the most evil men on the planet. Esther would probably